Times. And that's your water there.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone here in the room tonight um, and our online audience. Thank you all for coming along on such a horrible night um, to hear our wonderful speaker. First of all, a bit of housekeeping. So um, we're not expecting a fire alarm. So if there is one, please follow the exit signs to uh, meet in the courtyard or follow some of the people that know where they're going, hopefully. And those at home, please don't laugh. So there will be opportunity to ask questions at the end after Jodie's talk. Um, those in the online audience, uh, please post your questions in the chat and we will be monitoring that. And your questions will be asked at the end of the presentation as well. But welcome, we have got over 15 countries represented here tonight to hear Jodie's presentation. We're delighted from the Geological Society of London, the Forensic Geology Group, and the IUGS, Initiative for Forensic Geology, to welcome tonight Jodie Webb as our speaker. Jodie um, has known us as a group for many, many years. And we are delighted that she accepted our invitation to speak with us tonight. She earned her bachelor's in geology from Northern Arizona University and a master's in geology from the University of North Carolina. She's worked as a geologist forensic examiner for the FBI, Forensic Bureau of Investigation, in Quantico, Virginia, since 1997. So years of experience, I know. I know it seems a long time. She examines geologically derived materials for law enforcement agencies and provides expert testimony regarding her findings. Jodie's involved in research and standards development for forensic geology. She's a member of the OSAC or Organization of Scientific Area Committee, the ASTM International, and is an FBI advisor for International Union of Geological Sciences, our group who are here hosting the conference today. She's testified over 50 times in the challenging courts. She's worked on many major cases, but says that each case is equally valuable to society. And what she does is she just get stuff done. So with no further ado, I have much pleasure in inviting Jodie Webb to give us a presentation. Thanks, Lorna. That was that was a really nice introduction, and thank you for the to the committee for inviting me. I'm really honored to be able to give this talk tonight, and um, I I love being in London. Lorna said earlier, apparently it's the best city in the world. I I don't have any information to disagree with you. So um, it's been really great being here, um, and let's go ahead and get going. So we're going to talk about forensic geology in general today, um, and I've subtitled this, Why Does the FBI Need a Geologist? I hope that I will convince you that it does at the end of this, and if not, please do not tell my managers because they do not <laughs> need to see this. So the contributors that I'd like to acknowledge on this talk, because I've used a lot of their material, are Libby Stern, who's in the audience here, and my uh, colleague, Ian Saginor, who was not uh, able to be with us tonight. A little housekeeping of my own. We have to put up this disclaimer. You can read it, but basically I need to tell you that the words I say here tonight are mine alone and may not represent the views of either the FBI or the United States government. All right, so let's get let's get to the more interesting thing, uh, hopefully. So the FBI laboratory has been in existence since 1932 in one form or another. This is the current building that houses most of the FBI laboratory. We have a couple of other facilities. And our mission is to collect, analyze, and share timely, we can argue about that later, scientific and technical information. And I'm very proud to say that the FBI geology group has been in existence since J. Edgar Hoover uh, signed this paper here. That's a copy of our, uh, it's called a control file, but basically it was our, our right to exist, according to the Bureau, uh, in May of 1939. So we're, we're very excited to have that here. And the, the FBI laboratory has been housed in the old Department of Justice building 
and the uh, Hoover Building up in uh, Washington, DC. But for the last 20 years, it's been at the, the building I just showed you. So at one point, there were about 30 forensic geologists working at the lab. Now we're down to two with the lovely Libby helping us out for our GIS research needs. Um, now, this is my colleague, Ian. Ian is the one on the right, in case you weren't sure, Libby and myself. Um, so we get to do a lot of really wide ranging things. We would like to be able to have, have more people, but we're able to pretty much get it done with our, our team of excellent workers. So forensic geology, we've been talking a lot about that here. And I just wanted to say that the way we kind of define it is not what your traditional geology job might entail, because what I like to say is we look at rocks and then anything that was once a rock. That's how I say it to my, my jury. So this is, includes soil, rocks, minerals, and gemstones, and then their man-made derivatives, things like glass, uh, insulating materials, soil amendments. But we can, then that's a kind of a wide range of materials that we analyze. So we try and break that down into four categories of testing. Um, we've got our identification, our comparisons, provenance, and then search. So starting with it, sometimes you just need to know what is this stuff? Uh, we overlap quite a bit with our chemistry unit on, on these kinds of things. So they do some of the organic things um, and we do a lot of the inorganic things. Um, this middle from Balatini, nice Italian word, which are glass road beads spheres that they put in paint um, to identification and appraisal of gemstones. We get a lot of threat letters in our lab where um, people put stuff in it to try it. And most of the time it's not a dangerous material like anthrax or ricin because I mean, most people don't have access to that, but they still wanna write a threat letter. So what ends up happening, at least in our country is they'll just take whatever they have at hand. So sometimes talc is very popular, baking soda is very popular. Uh, we had several letters that we were able to tie together that had perlite in them. And sometimes we need to know, we can help investigators if we can give them a little bit about the manufacturing information. We look at some soil amendments. And then this bottom one, um, just old vermiculite, so not really challenging for any of us in the room here probably to identify, but this was a, an interesting case where there was an altercation and one person threw vermiculite into the eye of the other person. And she was claiming that it was poison. Now, I think it would be really uncomfortable to have vermiculite in my eye, but you know, not necessarily a poisonous material. And then we can be called upon to testify to our results. Um, and just, we, I, we are, the FBI laboratory is a branch of the FBI, obviously we're a division there, but we're, we're an oddity in that we can be called um, for either side, the prosecution or the defense, depending on what kind of information that we have. Now, oftentimes, we are most often called by the prosecution, um, but that's just um, one thing. We say the evidence is the evidence. And so sometimes that makes our law enforcement happy and sometimes it does not. This was a weird case that I worked um, on. They just needed to know an identification. So we had young Martre Poles. He was 19, an aspiring artist. And he disappeared in March of 2018. And his body was found in a plastic container, a big one that we use for storage about a month later. And it was covered with all of these crushed gray rocks. And they were like, okay, what, what is this, what and why? So they sent it to me and it, it just identified, again, pretty basic as uh, crushed limestone. Why is that important at all? Is because our computer forensics person took a look at the subject's computer and found them doing internet searches for how to dispose of a body with lime. So the um, subjects in this case were the, um, Mr. Cole's, his father's girlfriend, and she was aided with the uh, help of their teenage daughter. And the, um, you know, both subjects eventually pled guilty. Now, again, the geologists in the room are kind of, uh, you should be maybe, I hope, scratching your head saying, okay, how does Lyme help dispose of a body? <laughs> 
There you go. Thank you, Grant. Um, that's not what they meant. So sometimes, you know, people aren't as astute as they think they are. And what they really wanted to do was like slaked lime or calcined lime. Um, they didn't really mean this stuff, but they just went to their Home Depot and thought that was gonna do the trick. So I would say a lot, most of me, uh, primarily the work that we do are comparisons in forensics laboratories. Um, could this have come from this other known source? And sticking with soil for the moment, we usually get soil debris removed from items of evidentiary interest. And could that soil have originated from the known soil source as represented by these exemplar samples that we have? We, it looks fairly basic, um, the, the attributes that we look at, color, texture, composition. And the way we do our um, analyses is very, very case dependent. Um, in color here, we're using a Munsell soil color chart uh, in a controlled lighting situation. We have done colorimetry. We use stereo binocular and petrographic microscopy and X-ray diffraction as our sort of general tools and then anything else that we might need based on the, the case at hand. Um, and then in a, in a general comparison, what, what we usually do in a forensics lab is I, I have to say, we're looking for differences. And if we can find a difference, we'll stop our exam and say, these two things could not have originated from the same source. But if we get to the end of our exam suite and we haven't found any differences, then we have some sort of inclusion and then the language that we use is dependent upon the sample that we have. And we also, for soil, that is aided if we have a lot of known soil samples collected properly that can help us see how quickly the soil may be changing um, in the crime scene area. We also um, are aided by some of our open source online data like this one for color in the continental United States at different depths. Um, and this is from the National Conservation, wait, National Resources for Conservation Survey, sorry, um, in the Department of Agriculture. And this, what I like to show this is that I get, I've gotten this several times from prosecutors saying, oh, well, all soil is the same, right? I mean, my first question is, well, then why did you make me do your case? Because I just wasted a lot of time if you think that's the case, but um, it clearly is not. And then obviously we look at, it's a matter of scale. So this is a, a kind of lighthearted case that we had for comparison where we use those types of techniques. So we had um, a man that was, had drove his, his truck on a baseball infield and damaged it quite a bit. We call it doing donuts. It's like figure eight. I don't know what the, the British equivalent is, um, but he was recovered really quickly um, because he an off-duty cop actually was, saw him do it. So he got his truck immediately. It was covered um, with this red clay material. And But he said that he, his alibi was that he was mudding in the local creeks. And so fairly basic, they sent us lots of samples from the car. This was not a case of actual trace evidence um, and samples from the infield shown here. And we were able to say, okay, yes, it was quartz with a hematite that is was a not a natural soil. And then taking a look at the surrounding soil in the area that no natural soils of that color or that material occurred here. And just another little aside, I learned a lot. Um, I should have known about this because I just hadn't given it any thought. Baseball and softball and basically all sports, you know, they're such big business that we have entire standards uh, development organizations devoted to writing test methods for what should and shouldn't be the materials on these fields. I mean, of course, you want things to be fairly consistent or there could be allegations, but um, it's just kind of an interesting thing. I got to dive into that a little bit and find out what they actually uh, were able to do. And then he pled guilty. So the other thing that we do that is, I would say a lot more challenging uh, is provenance. And for us, again, might be a little bit different than um, your, 
real geologists. Um, where is this from? We, we want to help law enforcement with, provide some sort of investigative lead at this point. Most of the time, while I was talking to some people in the room, we would hope that they would call early. This often happens if their case has gone cold and they don't really know where else to go. So, and they're looking for someone. For, for the criminal cases, it's we're usually looking for uh, bodies. And uh, there's also intelligence aspects where they might be looking for um, places where they're making bombs, for example. Um, what we do here is, <laughs> again, fairly straightforward. We're gonna identify the properties and the stuff. And I, this, for example, you have a shovel and it was from a suspect and they, you know, there's allegations that they used that shovel to uh, do it, uh, to dig a clandestine grave. So we'll take the shovel, we'll remove it and identify the properties. So in addition to the geological materials that we talked about already, we're also going to look at the anthropogenic or man-made particles and then the, the biological components uh, such as pollen. Pollen can be a great tool to help us narrow down or eliminate possible sources. And sometimes, depending on what we have, all we can say is, well, we don't, we don't know where exactly where it is, but sometimes we can tell you where it isn't. Um, and then we compare them to maps and databases. We might use um, other reference material like personal consulting, ca calling a state geologist, for example, or um, research papers. So we're try just trying to find anything that we can about the um, soil and material in that area. And then we make some sort of determination about where those properties can be found and how good we can narrow something down obviously depends on the rarity of the materials that, that we see. So that's what kind of the general drift of what we're doing. And this has been kind of an interesting thing for the FBI because while we've been doing this for a long time, we've really, it's been so much, I don't wanna say easier, but we're trying to enhance our capabilities with all sorts of, all the online databases that we might have for the soils and geologies. Dating, this has been a very ageist day because people are talking about how old we are, but again, dating myself. And when I first started, um, we did these provenance cases, honestly, with paper maps. Um, some of you in the room probably not know. Don't even know what that is, but that's that's how that's how old we we were. And the first uh, soil um, case that I did with pollen, the palynologist expert was actually using overhead imagery to put the different. This is the the um, occurrence for pine pollen, and this is the, <laughs> the hemlock, and to narrow down the region. So we've come a long way for there, and we're always looking to enhance our methods and our techniques. And some of those just come from doing the case itself when we just find what we need out of, out of the work that we're doing. So this was a case of my colleague Ian's. Um, and it started off as um, a provenance case and then became a comparison case. So in this case, we had presumably a homicide, but a missing person at her house at point A. and the, the subject was developed pretty quickly because we're, they were pretty sure that he burned down her house um, and then drove about 100 kilometers or so and was arrested pretty much the next day. It was between one and a half and two days, um, about 100 kilometers away in point B. Now, this is the state of New Jersey on the East Coast, um, and the house was in Monmouth County on the coastal plain, if that means anything to anyone in the room or online. Um, the, the cool thing about this is that the, when they arrested him, he had muddy boots in his car with him and provenance is only good as good as our intelligence is to go with it. So we could be spot on with what we say about the soil, but if those shoes, if he wasn't wearing them when he allegedly committed the crime, they mean absolutely nothing. And we certainly have had cases, cases like that. But in this case, they actually had video footage of him um, from a CCTV camera wearing boots. I think he was walking into a bank, um, wearing those, those shoes the day before, and they were clean. So while it was not perfect, that's probably about as good as you can get. And so 
my colleague looked at this and it was it was an interesting case because right away he developed a couple of things that were rather unusual. Well, the color, and that's how where it was outcropping. And then the the two mineral phases that were were useful in this case were um, glauconite and ilmenite. And while sometimes we'll see one or the other together, it's not that and and in pretty good proportions, it's not that usual for us. And except here, they had you know this glauconite belt and bigger belt for the ilmenite. So he was able to narrow down the search area to that square or rectangle. And of course the house was in that area. The interesting thing about that is that the police kept saying, we really, really think he buried her around location B. Can you, can you compare it with samples? And it was such a, a huge stark change between the, the coastal plain and Northern New Jersey that Ian kept saying, look, the shoes might not mean anything, but if the shoes are relevant, we think it's here. And so come to find out they were, this is the picture of the house. And upon demolition, they actually recovered her body um, a little bit underneath the house. So he had buried her a little bit under the house. Um, and then it became a comparison. So what we do for provenance a lot of the time or for search when we get to it, if that's for investigative leads, we do write reports, but a lot of the time, and I'm contradicting myself because I've just had to testify to this, um, they don't actually, that part doesn't go into the court because once you find, if you find someone um, or the target that you're looking for, then it can become a comparison, you know, provided that you communicate that with your law enforcement and have them send you soil samples or whatever you're, you're looking for. And we, Ian had an inclusion um, with the boots. And then he went and testified in this. And I thought this, um, I like this headline here. Well, grave dirt and boots commit, uh, convince a jury. So that was, it did. <laughs> they had other evidence, but yes. Um, this is a fairly recent case. Um, and this is another provenance and comparison. And I'm, spoiler alert, I know, um, I, already, I already gave away the ending, but this was, had a lot of media attention. This was the disappearance of a young girl, Brizia Taylor, and she disappeared in July of 2020. And so the, the suspects here, Henry Dinkins, was known to her and to her mother. And so this was a difficult one because a lot of the biometrics meant absolutely nothing. She was known to have been in his car when she disappeared, but having her hair for example, in that car was not meaningful because she had been in that car before. So they uh, sent in some soil soil samples um, from his car and said, can you do a provenance determination? They also sent in comparison samples from areas of interest, the, the, the AOIs there. Um, and I had worked that part. We excluded all those areas and really didn't find anything else with the, the actual provenance case. And then her body was actually found and recovered in March of 2021. And at that point, uh, they collected soil samples and sent them in and they were indistinguishable to where, right near where the body was recovered. This is Ian and I testifying in the stand. This, is, this was on court TV, so we had to, <laughs> that was fun. Um, and actually the other interesting thing about this is this was actually a bench trial. And for us in the United States, that's actually very unusual. And but and the uh, defendant, Henry Dinkins, was actually allowed to choose whether he wanted a jury or a bench trial. But he thought that because of the um, horrific nature of the crime, that a jury would be very unsympathetic. Uh, so he he just chose to have a bench trial. So I did the the provenance. Ian really had the 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 good comparison, uh, and this is what the prosecutor said from closing arguments that it was the clincher of it all, the soil. But the, the thing that actually was very useful for us in this case is that they had evidence before the um, investigator took the soil samples, all this media attention you know, made the news and they said, okay, if you have any information, please call us. So and um, a 
a private citizen called in to the police and said, hey, I think I helped this guy. His truck was stuck in the mud. And I think I helped this guy out of the mud right around the that date that you are talking about. Um, and how's that for weird coincidence? And truly, that appears to be what happened is that he drove his his car up in the in, in embankment in order to to dump Fabrizio's body and then um, couldn't get the car out. And so this good Samaritan comes along, <laughs> didn't know who he was helping, uh, but did turn that into um, the police. And so they were able to collect right at that area. And that was right very near where her body was found. The switch gears a little bit. I talked about the four categories. This is one additional thing that we do. Um, but we do some fractography analysis. So this is um, a reconstruction or determination of cause and manner of breakage. We only work with brittle materials and uh, usually glass, but other, other brittle materials as well, like this case. This was a case where we had a domestic <laughs> dispute and this aquarium bubbler here was actually used, turned out to be the murder weapon. Um, pieces, and that's a, a bubbler, I don't know if that's, um, it goes in a fish tank, you know, to oxygenate the water. Somehow it got out of the fish tank and was thrown around the house. So there were pieces of this found throughout the household. The victim was found in the house, um, rolled up in towels, and uh, pieces of this were found with her on the body. And so fairly straightforward, there was a reconstruction, this item four fit back in, to this area. And then we did some things just for graphic um, appeal. We had it photog photographed and to see whether or not you could see where the fracture fit is. And then we did some LIDAR over here, just again, for demonstrative purposes. But even though this was basically fitting things back together like a puzzle, I went, that's not entirely what we do because in our work, the third dimension is really, really important. Um, so want to show you item four, the one that's a little redder, that was that was from the victim's body. And item three was a piece that fit together. So if you look at all the, it's kind of like a tool mark examination, um, bubbles across the, the, on either side, corresponding marks, essentially, to make sure, um, we do the same thing with glass, that that is um, an appropriate um, connection, that we haven't actually falsely fit it together. And we've done things, um, Fractography test. Uh, I've gone to train derailments. You know, how did the windshield of this this train break, and other things of that nature. So it's kind of an interesting thing that that we get to do. Was it a bullet? Was it a rock that hit the window? That kind of thing. So then we'll, let's get into search a little bit and spending most of the rest of my talk about this. So. <laughs> You know, really, I didn't really know much about search until I started working um, with the IFG in 2011. I think that's when I attended my first meeting. And really, it's just like finding stuff, right? But the British like to have definitions of everything. And so this is from, from Lawrence and, and others. Application and management of standard operating procedures and appropriate detection equipment to locate specific targets. And I think the key here um, that I, is appropriate. <laughs> So that is really, I think, um, what we as geologists can can help out with law enforcement. So traditional search methods, we've got your line searches, construction equipment or the forensic backhoe that we call them, you know, probing for soil disturbances, civilian volunteers. And, you know, all of these, a lot of these techniques, if they just go out and do it in law enforcement, these are what we call speculative searches. And we've mentioned it a number of times today, um, but if you're new to the, the audience, they're very costly. And a lot of times they have a low probability of success. So, and of course dogs, can't forget about the dogs. And while dogs are a great, great tool, they are a tool. And the, the strength or the, the quality of that tool varies. A dog is not a dog is not a dog. And, you know, some someone that can just take their house puppy out should try and find a body. That is not what we're talking about. We were talking about trained canine handlers and trained dogs and different dogs for different, um, different situations. So 
I've, I've learned a lot about that. That was not something that we were doing. So let's say that you are an agent in the field and you need to search for something. In the FBI, prior to about 2016, an average case agent would have to make a lot of calls. Um, both and these these are are, are different um, entities. CAS is con the computer forensics. This is across actually two different divisions in our science and technology branch. They might need to have outside experts like the IFG or the American Board of Forensic Anthropologists. And honestly, they, you know, our agents have so much in their training. Most of them are not going to know this. And they're not going to know, again, they don't know what they don't know. And they're not going to know, um, it, it, let's say that they they had a buddy in, in our um, Kate, you know, our operational technology division. Well, they might make that call to that person, but then that person retires. So then they don't have their contacts anymore. So, what to do about this? This I'm I'm very proud of this actually because this was really a grassroots I would say effort of caseworking analysts who we started talking to each other and we really said this. Is, you know, other people are way ahead of us. This is a real um, hole in, in the capabilities of the Bureau and let's, we need to make this easier for them. Um, so we developed the Geoforensic Working Group and we are trying to work and develop efficient search strategies. We are focused on, on human remains. And by drawing with, I, I, it actually says within the resources of the science and technology branch, we actually go outside of that branch a little bit. We talked about that in a moment. So this is a bit of the history of the Geoforensic Working Group. So prior to two, 2015, our um, canine consulting group at the ERTU, that's Evidence Response Team Unit, um, they worked on search. I know some people uh, who are here and us, they might, they've gone and, and helped dog with the dog training and things like that. But it was mostly focused on the canine portion of, of that work. And between then and 2017, the assets, we all kind of worked in a vacuum. And honestly, geology, we didn't do anything relevant to search um, before we started um, getting interest, involved with the IFG. And we're like, okay, hey, we, we can actually maybe help out with this. We do have the skills to do this. Uh, so we were reaching out to our, our canine groups and other groups, but mostly we we're working in a vacuum. And people realized that they were working on the same cases over and over. So work was getting du um, duplicitous and it was not great. So in 2017, we got together and we called, we called ourselves the geospatial working group. And we had a lot of assets, some things that we didn't mention yet, like um, behavioral analysis, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and it was pretty good, but and we started talking to each other, trying to develop things, but some, some on the advice of some of our, our colleague, Mark Harrison, who wasn't here, and uh, Lawrence, he came to speak to us, we decided that we needed to rebrand. Um, it reflects a wider uh, goal. And so in 2019, we, we changed our name to the Geoforensic Working Group. And we've pretty much been going strong ever since then. We were actually able to put together a new class for our experienced agents called Search Strategies for Human Remains. And in 2019, it's been a yearly uh, case ever since then. And it's it's really fun class, actually. It's, re it's really weird, though, because we get the agents together, and the first thing that they do Monday morning is they go out to a local park, and they've got a, a cadaver, you know, dead cadaver mannequin person, and they have to hide it. We have scenarios, whether this one's buried or this one's in a search. We get very strange looks from people who happen to be walking through the, the park. Um, and then we work all week with developing search strategies. And then at the end of the week, they switch their groups and then they go have to find their body. They have to develop a pre-search strategy and et cetera, use what the tools that they've, they've learned. And the cool thing about that is we have a lot of instructors working on that um, search strategies as well. And we always, when we're able to talk to the agents about their casework as well, um, we're able to expand what we do based on the needs that they have. So we're continuing, we're going strong, we're, we're getting a lot better um, and, and it, it's great. We meet quarterly and then do casework as needed. 
collaborative research. So it might be as, as benign as, is this a rock or a bone with our alternate light sources or um, other, hyper, other imagery? But we also do some behavioral analysis stuff. So we need to know one of the projects we've been working on is, well, how most people, they, they, if they're going to hide a body, um, they were talking about it's not going to be that far from a car or their house or whatever, because honestly, it's really hard to drag a body. How do I know this? This is me. Um, so we, <laughs> we do this uh, and we're taking statistics on um, people's age, their um, fitness, relative fitness level, um, their sex, their stature. And then they go out and they're like, okay, see how far you can drag this thing. Um, and I was very quick to volunteer for science. Um, and the fact that, that this guy's about the size and weight of my husband is just coincidence. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about our overview of search capabilities. It's a very simplified um, diagram, but it kind of gives us an idea and gives our agents an idea of how things fit together. So obviously we've got satellite imagery when you're looking up, up high airborne, and then we go to our airborne sensors up to 1500 feet. We've got our drones um, and that the drones have been, I think that's gonna be, I think it is, but it, it, they've expanded what they can do so quickly. And I think they're gonna continue to be really helpful. And then of course our canine consulting, we've got our near surface geophysics, geologists and anthropologists. So we're gonna go through that a little bit. So imagery, um, they, do all sorts of things. So one of the things, another thing we borrowed from you all here um, are the rag maps, the red, amber, green. And this is what our image analysts will give as part of our search strategy packet. And that's, this is putting together all the different layers, whatever they might be for the case specific, um, and trying to highlight points of what we think are the highest probability of finding your target, red being the highest, then yellow, then green. And again, we do a lot of caveats on here because you know, we're searching, we don't know everything. It's based on the intelligence. We might have to modify if some other information comes to light and, and redo what we've done. Um, but that's that's one of the things that, that we're developing. Historical imagery sometimes in, a, in and of itself is wonderful. Um, these two images here from 2004, 2005, there are, in reference to a case in the United States called the West Mesa homicides. This is, we believe, one serial killer um, working. He's killed um, a lot of women. We have found at least 11 bodies. But in 2004, um, this is the area of interest here. The next year, what we're looking for in this, in this historical imagery are changes um, in, so can we see a soil disturbance? Is there vegetative changes? Um, and all those sorts of brave masking. So I hope it's kind of obvious to you, but they found 11 bodies around that site. And um, a lot of serial killers, they tend to go back to the same place. That's where they feel comfortable. That might be um, shaded from roads or cars, or that might be you know, familiar territory. And so that that's kind of one of the things that we're looking for. But there's still several bodies that are, are um, women who are missing and that we believe uh, killed from this, this person. So we talk about our canine consulting. Again, a dog is not a dog is not a dog. So our, our group helps people in searches find the right dog for the job. But we decided that these in our search group in the geoforensic working group, they are gonna be the point person, point people, for each search strategy, because a lot of the times people are gonna ask for the dogs first. And sometimes they're like, we just want dogs. Um, but then based on the case, we're gonna, they're gonna look at the information and say, okay, but you need some other stuff too. And we're gonna, we're gonna put together a search strategy packet for you before you go out and search. And so they are the ones that they, they have the case information, they uh, read it, and then they basically send out um, work requests to the other groups, including geophysical techniques. And so the FBI does not really have advanced geophysical techniques 
um, that they're doing in-house anymore. We all have, uh, our evidence response team have um, metal detectors, but that's pretty much it. And this is one area where I, some of you have met Michelle Krull here. The laboratory, we are trying to work with our field agents to try and get the point across that uh, geophysics can be useful, but we need subject matter experts to help with when and how and which tools are appropriate for a job. Because frankly, what happened with the FBI is that GPRs were oversold to our, our agents. Um, I mean, honestly, it was when I started in the 90s and early 2000s. And they were, they basically, they bought a bunch of them, um, but then they realized well, it's, it's not like driving a lawnmower. You, you actually have to have some skill in interpreting it. And what are these squiggly lines? And it's not like, you know, the CSI effect. I, I, I love it. I don't like to watch too many cop shows, but um, I have seen a couple where they've seen the geophysics, um, the GPR diagram, and it's actually a body with hair and everything. <laughs> it's probably all crazy. But um, so we're trying to change um, the whole culture about uh, the use of geophysics, but that requires expertise. Um, that's what Michelle comes in and uh, to help us like, get, and, and we're trying to get people to say where they can go to get the right expertise. Cause again, if they, they might say I've used GPR, but you know, this, this guy used it and he, they, sometimes they oversell their qualifications, I guess. Um, this little QR code is if you, I know many of you have done this already and we had our poster session, um, but especially online, what we have questionnaires um, that we're working on here. And this is a link to the questionnaires. If you use geophysics, we'd really appreciate you filling these out because we're really trying to get an idea of who uses what, what tools and how successful they are. And that's gonna help focus our strategy for moving forward. So this is uh, what the, the geologists are doing. Um, this, we call this a diggability model. And this was developed um, with some open source data by the US Department of Agriculture. These are the, the parameters here that it's based on. Pretty straightforward, but this is basically how easy or hard is it for an average person to dig a shallow grave in a short amount of time? Um, the orange are you know the easier to dig and not knowing anything about the United States, like sandy sandy areas are gonna be easier in general. And some of the more mountainous regions, okay, that might be a little harder. And we give out with the search strategy package, diggability models. And this is the opposite of the red, amber, green maps, um, because in this case, red is the, the more difficult to dig, green being easier in the area. These are two models that we did in areas of interest. Now. Again, this comes with a lot of caveats because just because the soil is easy to dig, that doesn't mean that someone trying to get rid of a body knows where to go and where to dig. However, again, a lot of times, if people are trying to hide a dead body, um, they are doing it in areas that they know. So they might be familiar. And if it's completely unknown to them, um, let's say they started digging in this red area and the bedrock was, you know, 10 centimeters down or something like that, or a water table, for example, they're going to um, stop probably because they can't do it and, and move. So, um, you know, play move the, the body as we call it. So that's, that's what we do here. And again, it's just a model. And then if more information becomes available, we might reassess that. We have two forensic anthropologists board certified um, in our, in our unit. And in addition to other things that they do for search, what they're gonna help with um, several things that, again, is it a bone, is it not? Um, they can help with, depending on the age of the case, bone scatter or um, insect type of activity uh, on where they might be. So um, the interest, so that's, that's one of the things that they do. And they can actually do examinations uh, for, if it's got a scale on photographs so that the agent in the field could just take a nice to scale photo, they can send it to them and it'll, it'll help because if they're looking at a deer bone, you know, let's move on. But then that's something that, you know, again, your normal agent in the field is not going to be able to discern all of that information. 
So then what we get is the pre-search plan. And again, it's, this is this is an example of the packet that, that we would likely give out um, with, again, scenario-based uh, or seen intelligence-based and statistical-based plan. It's going to change based on the information we have, but we're going to give you, a, you know, some recommendations for what to do. Um, and so, uh, so this is what we've been sending out to the field. We're continually refining it um, and trying to bring in more assets depending on the case. So, but I've been pretty pleased with how how we've been able to to work together. So it's it's been a it's been a fun ex learning experience for me and and. Um, it's it's been a good good group to work with. So let's talk about a couple of cases. Um, this one is a, a horrific homicide. Uh, young boy AJ. Okay, he um, went missing. His parents reported him missing, but they turned out to be the prime suspect. This is a, a welfare situation gone horribly wrong. Welfare checks. They went out. The case agents were out searching for them in an area very close to their house. They sent us some muddy boots they believed the father was wearing. So they think that the, the scenario was the, the, the mother killed him, but the father was getting rid of his body. And then the shoes were actually the mother's boyfriend's shoes. They were trying to pin the homicide on. So this is a really definition of dysfunctional here. Um, so we got the shoes and they needed an answer right away. So we, we got it at like nine in the morning. By that evening, we were able to give them a preliminary assessment that had mud, but these distinct dolomite pellets. And the father also cooperated. He, the ne very next day, we went to this, so we said, look for this white road where they weren't searching. And this is um, the search area where they found his body. This is, we had a lot of media, like helicopters trying to take pictures. So we were trying to be um, discreet there. There's the white road. And the, they found a shovel at the um, suspect's house. So this is when the comparison or the, the search becomes a comparison. And this is just, a, these are x-ray diffraction well slides, but just show you um, the two samples from the shoes and then the, the shovel, and that's the grave and the road. So they're very distinctive and, uh, you know, an inclusion. Right, one last thing that we also, sometimes they let us play real geologists and go on site doing an on-site assessment. This is another cold case. Um, and from 1977, a victim goes missing. There was interest in this spot here and there was a house here. And more recent imagery showed that this whole field, so it was, it was wooded and, and hard to see at that point, had been um, cleared and mowed flat. We also learned, um, did some pre-search by so GPR was done by someone who didn't really have a lot of, um, anyway, it, the lovely Michelle re, um, reevaluated this and there was an anomaly, but not, nothing really to say, oh, hey, a body was, was buried here um, and some dog hits, but sometimes they don't listen to us. We, they went on site and we're going to search anyway, but they also thought that it, it might, the GPR might not have been super crucial because they thought the body might have been buried very deep. And this area they had it in the interim, you know, 29 years. Um, I know that's not the right math, but I'm just, we've been dating ourselves too much tonight. Um, they had, it been used as a dump and, and had, there's some, some construct construction. So they were able to go, they wanted us to go out and say, so we're going to search this area uh, in the horizontal axis, but how deep are we going to, when do we stop? When do we stop digging? And so they brought out construction equipment. <laughs> yeah. The forensic backhoe again. Um, and so this is a, a better example of, of what they found. And the geologists might be able, this might be pretty obvious. They were looking for a buried forest floor. And so we were able to see that. And then they had some slag and, and the, um, just fill, fill dirt, basically. But if you can imagine, people that don't have any sort of soil science or geology base, this is just going to look like one big lob to them. So um, Ian and Libby actually went on site here, and 
you know, we always need to do things to scale. So Libby was just, she was our scale here, just showing how deep the uh, one of the trees were buried. They didn't actually find the body yet, but Ian and Libby were able to say, okay, this is the forest floor, you can stop digging. So pretty much on time, I'm ready to, this is it. Um, so if you want more information, um, this is a link to a short video that we made um, the, the Organization of Scientific Area Committees in a conjunction with the IFG for collection of soil samples. It's made for law enforcement. It's very short and it's, it, you know, if you can't go on site, that's how to collect it. And then some information on the laboratory division. Our website's pretty out of date. And if you'd like to contact me, um, you can reach me at geology at fbi.gov or me or any of my colleagues will get that email. Thank you very much, Judy. And um, we've now got time for questions. And um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, that was very Pleasure. appropriate. And if we gave you a type of dog, you're a pedigree bloodhound. Oh, so, I love the blood. Thank, you. <laughs> thank <laughs> you very much. Tasty. Yeah. So does soils, but it's I know. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? I have two questions. Is that okay? Sure. Well, I don't know, Lorna. Yeah. She's <laughs> Okay, okay. Um for secluded areas, is it better to use like map maps or the online maps. What was the first one you said? The for like secluded areas. Yeah. Like woodland floors, cave type places. But what kind of maps was the first? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. The paper maps, sorry. Oh, the online maps. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the paper maps, I mean, this the scale is the same. They've just digitized a lot of the stuff. But what we would what we would actually do is um, so in wooded areas, some of the imagery, like the hyperspectral or, or drones, might not be very useful. Um, so what we might want to do in that case is if we're if we have some soil that we we know is relevant, that provenance thing, we might say, can you go take some soil samples and we'll, we'll analyze and, and see, you know, this is the closest. It's kind of an iterative process, and then they might go out again, or we'll go out if the if the samples get ridiculous to collect that type of thing. So you wooded area, it, it's hard. It's there's no there's no magic answer to that. So we just try and do uh, what we think is best depending on where we are and the, the time frame of the case. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, my name's Stephanie, I'm a data analyst. Um, I was wondering when you were talking about inclusion rather than, um, cause I think I hear a lot about, um, things that cannot be excluded rather than things that can be excluded. What is the threshold for that when you're looking at, so I mean, I'm, I imagine there's lots of different ones, but yeah. at well, which point do you get to sort of a, a percentage of, um, certainty? It's a really good question. Um, this might take a, a minute, but so first of all, to back up, I so there's a couple of different terminologies that are at, at use. So the Department of Justice has words that we use for an inclusion and exclusion, and uh, in you know can't in can't be determined, inconclusive. But the the words that we might say for an inclusion would be um, these cannot be differentiated. Therefore, um, the possibility that they originated from the source can't be excluded. So we use the exclusionary terms for started. The threshold, um, it, that's tricky. Um, you're gonna hear, if you're here tomorrow, you'll hear a talk about how we're working on um, maybe some statistical evaluation. Right now, what we do is um, the, the Munsell color has to be the same. We have um, a color uh, standard uh, test method from ASTM that gives us some criteria for that. Um, texturally, um, we're doing that just usually by stereo binocular and petrographic microscopy because we sometimes there can be fractionation of our, our question items and we do take that into account. We write about it in our reports. We disclose what we've done. If you know, if the stuff we're looking at on a genes is only a certain size fraction, 
that's going to work. We try to compare like to like. And then when we do our composition, it we look at major, minor, and trace mineral phases. And those have to be essentially the same. But there's some there's definitely some wiggle room in that. Um, and, and that is true. What we the way we try and get around that is that we have all of our reports um, reviewed by another person or all of our cases. If we have an inclusion that goes all the way, we, we actually do everything. But um, and, and that kind of helps us. But we are always you know looking to to do some statistical basis, but we don't really have that information right now to do to on, on what basis, what's the threshold. So we're, we're kind of working on that. You have a second. For the canine units, is what if you have like a missing persons and you don't know if they've just wandered off or if they've been kidnapped? Do you use both cadaver dogs and the ones that smell the life? Um, oh. so not really in a good position to answer that, but usually we try and, and see, depending on if, if it's just a missing, we think it's just a missing person, then we wouldn't use a cadaver dog. Um, we'd use a human scent dog. I think that's the right term, right? Um, yeah. So, so until we, we know, but again, um, based on what we know with behavioral and, and stuff after a few days, we would probably, you know, add that in as well. You have the online question, and then we'll come to Grant after that. Um, okay, so this one's from Rich Arthur. He starts by saying, you started by saying there used to be many more forensic geologists. To what do you attribute this reduction, and what do you think can be done to get more geologists employed in this field? Um, and then the second part of the question is, what can JOLSOC and other similar organizations do to improve public appreciation for forensic geologists. Okay, so Rich, remember my my disclaimer at the beginning? Because <laughs> these words are not gonna be, um, well, actually what, what really happened is you just, the reallocation of, of resources, mostly in um, some of our DNA groups, because when that that came online, and that makes sense, you know, um, it, it, if you can get DNA, uh, that's going to be uh, an identification measurement versus a class type um, comparison that that we deal with in in all geological materials. Um, but so that that's that's a little tough. When I started, there were actually six of us. So um, that it just we just keep getting it narrowed down. We have been trying to. What happens is like a lot of people don't even know we exist, and so in, in the United States, some trace disciplines and state laboratories are, are getting smaller. So we've been trying to do some outreach saying, you know, well, we'll take some state cases. Um, and then if we get more cases, then that's going to be justification for hiring more, more people. But we really, we're trying to do outreach, even with our own organization, they might not know that we exist, some of the, the smaller disciplines. And then we do, um, sometimes that we have, you know, the, the repeat customers, once they know that we exist, you know, they have a, um, one of our, our field agents is basically keeping Michelle busy all the time with all of her, all of his searches. But um, so I, I guess that's the best question. And I do believe that working with the IFG, OSAC, um, ASTM, anything that we can do um, for outreach and um, improving our methods and, and all that, that kind of thing is, is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. My question is that you uh, mentioned you've given quite a bit of testimony based on the evidence you've gathered. You also said that uh, the cases are all unique. There must be some commonalities. Could you perhaps share some of your experience and how you would address uh, providing evidence in a criminal case? Yeah, good question. So, I mean, we have, they're unique and the I, I, situations are, are unique, but we do, we have standard um, technical procedures that that we follow. Um, but sometimes with geology, um, it's 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 not always just rote, which kind of keeps it interesting. That's that's why we like it. 
But in, in the end, the, the testimony is based on, you know, writing report that are fairly consistent. Um, like for our, our comparison language, we have pretty much standard language that we use. I've, I have testified um, to some weird things. Sometimes if you, they, like I've testified several times to fiberglass insulation, which is very strange thing to testify to. And it doesn't, you know, and I had to say, oh, wait, this is, this didn't, you know, this is mass manufactured. I have no idea how much is in the environment at one time, et cetera. Um, but they thought it was important. And I also have had testified, we have a lot of um, admissibility hearings going on in the United States right now. And that's, does the scientific evidence meet the threshold uh, to be uh, presented in court? And um, so I've, I've done those as well. And you have to go through um, basically steps about if it's how long it's been around, if it's peer reviewed, what methods do you use, et cetera? What are your potential error rates? So how do you explain complex geologic scenarios in this simple language so that, for example, a jury could understand it? Try to keep it fairly simple for a jury, depending on the makeup of the jury. Um, we say things such as um, the color texture and composition, the soil recovered from the pants uh, could not be distinguished from um, the crime scene as represented by K1, no, our known exemplars. Um, and then again, therefore the possibility um, that it originated from the source cannot be excluded. When we go to court, we repeat that, you know, we basically say that, and then we try and talk about, uh, we also have a limitations and interpretation section in our report that talks about, we try to make it as simple as possible, um, a small paragraph about how soil varies um, and the, the, the possibility of transfer, a little bit of transfer um, might be a reason why you might have an inclusion or, or not. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so one online from Rosie Mann, what kinds of spatial resolutions are generally available when you are doing these exclusions provenance work? <laughs> I mean, the usual, it, it depends. Um, I think some of the regular geology maps, one to 1200, it's about as good as you're gonna get, um, unless we get, like you said, a, a, a reference paper or something like that. So it's not, it, it, it's, that's why, again, we have, for these, we have a lot of caveats. So the more information we have and the rarity of the components that we have um, are gonna depend on how small we can mm -hmm. narrow down that spatial resolution for them. Uh, for example, um, my colleague had a case I presented at the APST uh, where she had a, a rather unusual mineral assemblage for that location in the United States. Um, and so she was able to give it a little bit more, more weight for, for that than you might normally have. So, did I answer the question, sort of? And what's the question? I think that seems immense. And I think there's lots of questions there that can still be answered. But if you'd like to contact me, you know, <laughs> yep. and just thank you so much, Jody. Thank you again. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you.